This happened around 2006 when I was in my mid-twenties, and my sister, the unfortunate main character in this story, had just turned 21. At the time, she and her boyfriend lived with my fiancé and I. On weekends, we went out to one of the two bars that had karaoke and air hockey. This particular night, we were at the bar further out from where we lived in the city, a good half an hour by car. Everyone was having drinks, socializing with people we knew. It was one of those places, lots of regulars, singing karaoke. Nothing out of the ordinary really except that night my sister started hanging out with these two older ladies who had a liquor store in their purses and were quite sharing, although I didn't know it at the time. As she tended to drink a lot more than me, that was a score for her, less money spent on drinks, but she ended up far more hammered than usual. Towards the end of the night, around 1.45, she was really drunk. The aforementioned fiancé, my sister's boyfriend and I, were in a heated air hockey game, planning to leave as soon as it was over. She walked up to us and said she was going to smoke a cigarette outside until we were done. About five minutes later, we paid our tab and walked out, but she was not on the porch area where smokers congregated. Okay, weird, but not alarming. We went out to the back of the bar to check for her inside, in the restroom and the large parking lot. It is notable that this particular bar was in a business park, so there were multiple businesses that were closed, as well as the Mexican restaurant next door that had just closed as well. We searched, asked everyone that knew us and those who didn't if they had seen her. No one had. I asked the co-workers from the restaurant that were sitting outside as well. They seemed nervous when telling me they hadn't seen her, but I didn't think on that much until later. By then, I was in a full-on panic mode after trying to call her cell about 15 times, only to have it go to voicemail. Being a bit inebriated myself, I started searching for her went as far as to take off my heels and start running down the highway searching for her, as honestly there had been times sh she would start walking home in the past, though never from this place as it was so far away from where we lived. The fiancé and her boyfriend thought we should go to the house to see if she got someone to bring her home. It seemed unlikely but not unheard of. We get home and she's nowhere to be found. Just as we were about to head back and I was going to phone the police, I received a call from the police department on my phone. They indicated that they had my sister, and there had been an accident, and I needed to get down there. We rushed to the police department where we were taken into a room with my sister. Her face was red from obvious crying, and bruises were starting to show on her arms and chest. She said that, when she told us she was going outside... She thought we said we were leaving then, so she walked to the car. After a few minutes, being drunk and tired, she sat down up against it to wait. A van pulled up, and a young man was asking her directions to somewhere. She walked closer to try to explain when suddenly the back door flew open and two other men grabbed her and threw her in, taking off. They were rough with her, hitting her a few times while holding her down, saying they only wanted money. They snatched her purse from her, breaking the straps and searching it, quite haphazardly as they didn't find the $30 she had in it. After driving around a bit speaking in Spanish, she couldn't understand, and they had pulled out a gun, making sure she saw it and put a bandana around her eyes, telling her they'd let her go. She was driven to some woods by a neighborhood she did not know. The door was open and they pushed her out, telling her to run, that if she took the blindfold off or turn around, they'd shoot. She ran and ran. Eventually, she did take the blindfold off and came to the first door she saw, beating on it and screaming for help. The police were called, she was picked up, and now we are back to my being there, hearing what I feared had happened. Report filed. Police did a search and did locate the bandana she ripped off, but as she was so intoxicated and terrified, she was not able to give a clear description of the van other than white older model or the three occupants other than young Hispanic men. The investigation turned up nothing as no cameras caught any of this. We even had detectives in our home who said, Look, we need the truth. 
If you got drunk and just went home with someone and didn't want your boyfriend to find out, we will file charges on you. Aside from the bruises, broken purse, and her trauma, there was nothing concrete to go on. That was unpleasant. I am still fairly convinced someone at the restaurant knew something, and given their suspicious behaviors when I asked about her, but the police were never able to find that link. All said and done, the guys were never found. Eventually we just moved on, in different states. It's now just a story in our lives. It still makes me sick, thinking of what could have happened, but thankfully didn't. I was 19 years old and the only female working at a shop specializing in automotive batteries and things of that nature. I had been working there for long enough to realize that most of the clientele was male and oftentimes made for some awkward situations. For instance, I would get talked down to and patronized quite a bit or flirted with to the point where I would be somewhat uncomfortable. I have really thick skin though, so either way I typically wasn't bothered. One day during a particularly busy rush, a very tall and well-built man who was maybe in his mid-thirties came through my line. I considered myself to be pretty good at reading people and this guy had some very, very strange energy. He seemed a little off. However, it was my job to be professional and assist whoever came through my line. I brushed aside this uneasy feeling. I just wanted to ring this guy out and get through the rest of the line that was now trailing out the front door. I greeted him and talked to him as I would any other customer while I was processing his transaction. Things were going fine until he realized I was almost done. He started stalling, making up weird excuses as to why he couldn't use certain credit cards, how he needed me to put this battery on hold and he would be back, etc. I told him I would hold it for him and that he could come back whenever he found the time. I figured he would leave at that point, but he just stood there and stared at me. Now that I think about it, he was more staring through me than at me. I was a bit uneasy, but kept my polite, professional demeanor. Sir, if you're not purchasing anything at the moment, maybe I can ask you to step aside so I can assist other customers? I said. He completely disregarded my question and, in a slow, raspy voice, asked, So, what's your name? I didn't wear a name tag specifically for reasons like this. Thinking quickly, I threw out my nickname. Uh, it's Rhea. Rhea, he said as he kept staring. I just smiled awkwardly and said, Yep, that's me. By this point, my manager had realized what was going on and he proceeded to ask the man to step aside as well. After hearing it from my manager, the man walked to a corner of the store by some shelving and continued to stare while I was ringing the rest of the customers out. A bit of time went by and the line had cleared up, but he was still standing there, staring and now smiling the most sickening smile I think I'd ever seen. It made my skin crawl. Of course, my manager and coworker saw this too, and my coworker grabbed my arm and said, Come on, dude. Let's go out back. As we were walking to the stock room, my manager asked the man if there was anything else he needed. The man muttered that there wasn't and left. I wish that was the end of it, but of course, he had to come back in to purchase the battery. When he came back the next day, we again had a line. He let people go ahead of him and waited until I was free before coming up to the counter to make his purchase. I greeted him again and tried to remain professional, but it was hard considering how creeped out I was. I was again met with the same stare and the same freaky smile. I can't remember the entire conversation, but at this point, the questions he was asking became personal, weird, and inappropriate enough for my coworker to cut in. He looked at the guy and then at me and said, Rhea, go take your break. Before he basically pushed me out of the way of the computer and rang the guy out, I stayed in the back until my manager came and got me, 
telling me it was safe to come out. We were all pretty creeped out, but thought that that was the end of it. A few days went by, and we had all mostly forgotten about this creepy dude, until he walked in again. This time, though, he didn't look through the store, didn't approach the counter, didn't say a word to anyone. He just stood, jacked hood pulled up over his head in the corner of the store, staring and smiling. The smile had become even wider and more sinister looking and at this point I actually started to freak out. I started shaking and feeling sick to my stomach. Then my manager cut the horrible tension by pretty much screaming at the guy. Hey, I'm sick of you coming in my store and pulling this. The creep paid him no mind and kept right on staring. This made my manager even more angry and he walked out from around the counter and told the dude, Look man, if you don't quit coming in here and staring at her, I will not hesitate to call the cops. What you're doing is harassment, so you need to get out of my store. At the mention of the police, this dude's smile dropped and he slowly sauntered out of the store. We never saw him again, but I was immediately taken off closing shifts due to fear that the man would come back and try to catch me when I was alone. I've definitely dealt with my fair share of creeps at that job, but this guy was by far the most disturbing. While in junior high, I had few friends, but was not shy or reclusive, just an average boogerhead. When outside on lunch break, I was walking by the monkey bars. A couple of girls were sitting on the chin-up bars off to the side. As I passed, one of the girls started talking to me. Normal questions. Who are you? What grade? Age? Etc. One of the girls may have spun down or slipped. Anyway, she was hanging upside down by one knee. She locked her other leg in a similar position and turned loose with her hands. Her shirt slid right down and over her head. She was fully exposed since her bra didn't seem to fit right and everyone was laughing and looking, but no one was helping. No one noticed the tissue I could plainly see. I grabbed her shirt and pulled it up to cover her, helped her get down, and walked with her to the building. I figured, good deed done. Not quite. After school, she was waiting for me. She gave me a hug and then kissed me on the mouth. I pulled back because I do not know this person and I don't want to get involved. I guess she thought I was offended and she asked me, What's wrong? Never been kissed by a girl before? I told her, No, but that was not the problem. She asked what the problem was and I truthfully told her that I don't remember her name and I didn't know her. She laughed and said, Letitia. We said goodbye so I could catch the bus. The following Monday, Letitia is waiting for me at lunch. She tells me that she never did thank me for saving her. I told her not to worry about it. It's cool. We walked around the soccer field and then she stops me with her hand and says, My mom wants to meet you. What? I asked her why and she tells me that she told her mom what happened and now she wants to meet me. She goes on to say, She's picking me up so you can meet her then. We go back to our classes. I never was academically inclined, so now the day just will not move along. School ends and after dragging, I meet Letitia. We talk in the parking lot and she gets all happy and says, There's mom. We walk over and her mom gets out of the car and gives me a hug. I'm internally having an anxiety attack. She says how good it is to meet me, how nice I was to have been there for her daughter and then she says, you must come home for dinner. Oh man, what are you talking about? I start making excuses about how my parents don't like me out on school nights. She says, Hey, don't worry. It's all taken care of. I already called you mom. Dinner, tomorrow night at 6. They get in their car. I get on the bus, cussing phone books. Oh mother, why did you say yes? She replies that it will do me good to meet other people, and girls. I had visions of telling her, oh, I've met her alright, seen some stuff too, we even tongue wrestled. 
The next day just sucks. It takes forever, and at the same time, it jerks forward at warp speed. Lunch break truly sucked. Letitia had told everyone that I was going to her house for dinner. Oh, and to meet my dad. Great jumping Judas, like seriously, what is happening? I walk back to the building and spend the rest of the school day planning my escape while answering questions about dinner. What's for dinner? The day ends without me having a plan. She walks me to the bus since her mom isn't there yet, and then she kisses me. Even the bus driver sat and watched. I got home, say not one word to anyone and go to my room. My mother pops her head in and tells me to change for my date and goes back to where she came from. She drives me over and says they will bring me home. Oh no, you come get me. I don't know these people. I don't know why I'm going, why I was invited or anything. You come get me mom or I'm not going. She agrees and tells Letitia's mother she will pick me up. They agree on a time and my mom leaves. I meet her three brothers, her two sisters, a cousin, and her grandmother. Everyone was cool. Well, one brother keeps giving me a stink eye, but there's nothing I can do, so I ignore it. I thought maybe, just maybe, I could hang out with the three brothers, even the one with the stink, but that didn't happen. I end up sitting next to Grandma, which was cool because Letitia is hovering. After about 15 minutes of nothing conversation, her dad comes home. And this man is huge. He steps up to me as I stand. I think about running, and he smothers my hand in his. He says, So you're the boy who's seen and rescued my daughter's exposed breasts. I died. I stood there and thought I was going to pass out. He asked me a couple of questions that I just nodded and shook my head to. My mind is screaming at me to talk. He says, Take a seat. I did. He spoke for a while, telling me that interracial relationships were difficult at best. I can feel my neck twisting around to look at Letitia while he says that, at most, you can expect a little hostility. She walks over and sits above me on the arm of the couch. I'm looking at her dad and then her over and over again. She reaches out and takes my hand. I finally find my words and whisper, what did you tell them? She laughed and said, Just that we're girlfriend and boyfriend. I didn't mention the other thing we did. I'm thinking, You kissed me. Do you think she whispered this? Not a chance. Her dad stops talking and is just looking at us. Her grandmother, having sat right there the whole time, turns and adjusts her seat on the couch so she too can look at us. I'm turning red. Embarrassed, yes, but I'm getting angry. Her dad says, What thing? I told him, She kissed me. It came out as an accusation. He looks at me, then he looks at her. Now this, this idiot, this crazy, tissue-wearing fool is going to get it. He takes a deep, slow breath and says, Well, maybe you two will make it. Make what? When the two of you are old enough, and if you still want to... I will give my blessing. I'm red angry. Blessing for what I say. He says, You'll marry my daughter. I'm stunned. I'm having a major brain fart. I snap out of it when she starts sliding down the arm like she's going to land on me. I popped up and bam, out the door. Forget being picked up. I'm running. I get home to an empty house. I go to my room and lay on the bed. The phone rings. I go into the kitchen and answer it. It's my neighbor. He asks if I'm okay and I say I am. He tells me that my mom is out driving the streets looking for me. She got a call that I had left in a rush and everyone was worried. I said I was fine and hung up. I turned on the lamp in the living room to show that someone was home and went to bed. The phone rings again. I return to the kitchen and answer. You will marry my daughter. It was her dad. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing the phone games again. Forget this guy. Sir, I wouldn't marry your daughter for all the tea in China. You will marry my daughter. 
I don't know what she told you. I don't know if she's crazy or if you are, but I'm not, and I repeat, not marrying her or anyone else. I helped her, and she kissed me. I didn't even know her name. We're not dating, we have never dated, and never will. He got quiet for a bit and then said, Is what you just said true? I replied, Yeah, every word. He tells me to watch for his sons until he can come collect them. He then hangs up. The brothers announce themselves with pounding on the door. Oh, it's the whole family and they're all nuts. I start gearing up with multiple sweaters and two pairs of blue jeans. I get my bat ready and walk into the living room. I look out the bay window. They're still there. I look at my dad's gun rack but don't grab one. I know they're all loaded. I do mentally select the weapon I will use if everything does suddenly go insane. Thankfully, the banging has stopped. I look out the window again. The neighbor is talking to the brothers. While I watch, first my mom pulls into the drive and then their father pulls up. My mom goes and talks to them. I can picture her telling them all to come in. After a minute or two, she comes in. Are you okay? Mom, was this some kind of sick joke or prank? She walks over and hugs me and says, No, son, you did a good thing at school. Don't let this stop you from doing the right thing. She continued, I'm sorry, I had no idea. I went to my room where I just sat there. I don't even remember what I was thinking. To this day, almost 40 years later, I just shake my head when this memory returns. This past Friday, I, a 27-year-old male, fell asleep around 8 p.m. after work. When I woke up around 9 p.m., I decided it was too late to go out, so I made a plan to run to the gym down the street instead for a late-night workout. The small all-men's gym is just about a mile down the road. It was empty and dark inside, but the owner had given me the door code to get in. However, for whatever reason, the code was not working and I could not get into the gym. I still wanted to get a workout in, so I decided to just extend my run and head up to the local middle school playground and do some pull-ups on the monkey bars instead. I figured it was better than no workout at all. I got to the block that the middle school was on and began walking down toward the playground. On the way, I passed two young girls walking the opposite way. I would guess they were about 11 to 12 years old. They were silent and looked at me nervously as we passed. Understandably so, as I am a reasonably large man standing at 6 foot 4, and it was almost 10 p.m. at night on an empty street. I live in a little suburban town of about 12,000 people with little crime. It is a dry town and mostly larger residential homes. The town is only two miles across and has a very safe family feel. Most of the residents are upper-class families here to take advantage of the great school system. Despite the reputation of safety the town has, I thought it was much too late and dark out for these young girls to be wandering the streets alone, as creeps can show up anywhere, anytime, something I would soon enough witness to be true. I hope they are heading home, I thought to myself. I then got to the playground attached to the middle school. The playground is on the corner of the block with an alley leading to a parking lot behind the school separating the playground from the local high-speed line going into the nearby city about 10 miles away. The high-speed line is built underground with an open top and high walls topped off with a chain-link fence to keep pedestrians from falling in. There is a bridge to cross the tracks below and then another street on the other side of the tracks from the school, running parallel to the rails with one way going into the downtown business district and the other way going into a residential neighborhood. The young girls turn onto the street going toward the neighborhood away from downtown. I did one set of pull-ups on the monkey bars and was resting when I noticed a white pickup truck with the headlights cut and a raised cab with blacked out windows covering the bed of the pickup truck, moving slowly past the middle school in the same direction the girls were going moments before. I found this very suspicious. 
and even more so once the truck stopped directly in front of the playground, almost as though the driver and passenger was checking it out. I stared at the truck wondering what was going on when I then noticed that there was a man walking about 20 feet behind the truck in the same direction. As he passed the stopped truck, the window of the truck rolled down and I could see there were two men in the truck. I clearly saw the man walking, looking over and made a keep going forward hand signal to the driver and passenger, which followed his directions and started moving again, creeping slowly along with the headlights cut just as they were before. I watched as they crossed the tracks and saw the man on foot go right on the parallel road along the tracks toward downtown, while the truck went left on the same street toward the residential neighborhood in the same direction the young girls had gone less than three minutes before. What did I just witness? I thought to myself as I tried to make sense of what I had just seen. To me, that the truck and man on foot were following the young girls, stopped at the playground to see if they were there, and kept going when they only saw me doing pull-ups. I felt sick to my stomach. I tried to think of what else these men could have been up to. Looking for a lost dog? No, I mean, they weren't calling out, and were driving much too slowly. Making a drug deal, maybe. But what kind of a drug deal goes down at a fairly well-lit school area? Also, the man on foot signaling the truck forward and then going opposite ways down the next cross street didn't make sense for a deal. In my head, I thought, at best, what I saw was some kind of deal. At worst, it was predators stalking two young girls in hopes of abducting them. I decided to follow the man on foot to find out. I followed him as he walked along the wall separating the sidewalk from the tracks below. On the other side of the street was a church and some office buildings. He was walking slowly and texting someone on his phone. I turned around and saw that the truck had stopped again about two blocks up the road in the opposite direction. The man on foot then completely stopped as I approached him. I couldn't be sure as to whether he realized I was following him, so I approached him in the most casual way possible. The man, looked to be in his early 30s, stood about 5'10 with a slouch and had curly hair with a noticeable scar going down the side of his head through his hair. From the moment I began speaking to this man, I could tell he was very nervous. The way he acted and talked made me even more suspicious up until the conclusion of our conversation. Admittedly, my adrenaline was going, so I don't remember the conversation word for word, but below is how it went down. Hey, what's up man, what are you doing? Not much, just hanging out. Just hanging out, huh? Well, where are you going? Just going on a walk. I saw you signal that uh, sketchy truck back by the playground. It was kind of weird. What's up with that? Nothing at all. I just waved to them as I walked by. You didn't just wave to them. I saw you make a hand signal for them to keep going. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know them. I'm not stupid. I clearly saw you signal to them. I know that you know them. Just tell me what you really were doing out here because that was very suspicious. I'm not up to anything. Walk and talk with me about it. No, stop. Tell me what you're up to right now. You're acting very suspicious and it's making me nervous. I know you're up to something, so just tell me the truth. I don't care if you're buying drugs. I, I do them myself as well. I, listen, I, I'm a good Christian man, I swear. He pointed to the church behind me across the street. I didn't ask what your religion was or whether you're a good person. I asked what you and that sketchy truck are up to. Now, do you want to tell me or should I call the police and have them come and ask you? You can call the police. I'm not up to anything. Just leave me alone, please, man. I'm, you're scaring me. The man then turned and started walking away again, faster this time. I admit that I was quite angry at this point, as I knew I was clearly being lied to and this guy was definitely up to no good. I push him, not very hard, with one arm to get him to stop. The dude loses his balance and almost falls over but then immediately starts sprinting away from me down the street, turns the corner, and then continues to sprint into the downtown business district, 
passing right by the few other pedestrians on the street. There was no reason for me to chase him, so I lost sight of him as he ran away. I looked back, and the truck down the road that was stopped at the beginning of the conversation was gone. I then take out my cell phone and call the non-emergency police line to report everything I had seen. The police thanked me and sent a patrol car to the area by the middle school. When I told my girlfriend about what had happened, she was very upset with me for following and confronting the man. However, after what I saw, I am still convinced that I witnessed three men stalking the young girls with the intent to do them harm. I cannot come up with any other explanation as to what I could have possibly been going on. Seeing how nervous the man was talking to me, paired with how he lied and then took on running, only further convinced me of what I saw. I followed my gut instinct and took action. I would do it all again, however, I would have called the police before confronting the man myself if I could redo the whole thing. My girlfriend's concern was for my safety, although I was much bigger than the man and made sure he was at least an arm's length away from me at all times. He could have been armed, so I understand my girlfriend's concern. At the very least, I hope that I thwarted a possible crime. And for the creep that ran away from me, stay away from those girls. I've come to the conclusion that I am a magnet for creepy encounters, crazies, and potentially dangerous situations, probably because I can be incredibly naive. But regardless, let me share you my most recent crazy encounter which happened just before my much needed vacation to Arizona. For starters, I would say I am a fairly attractive female. Blonde hair, blue eyes, about 5'2 and 125 pounds, so not super tiny but definitely not very big either. I also can't seem to tell when people are generally being nice to me or if they're flirting as I'm super oblivious, which may be the cause for what transpired. I won't disclose exactly where I work, but I will say that I work at a warehouse and club that you have to have a membership in order to do your shopping. Specifically, I work in the membership department, so I deal with new signups, questions, issues with memberships, credit cards, angry members who demand they speak with the manager, or who just want to complain at you even though you have no control over a policy. As part of the member service department, we are expected to always be super happy-go-lucky friendly and helpful. Granted, our entire company is dedicated to making our members happy, but the membership desk is supposed to be the Disneyland of the warehouse. With the member once, we will bend over backwards to try and make it happen, which can lead to some entitled jerks when they can't get their way and some incredibly scary encounters. For reference on just how crazy it can be, I had one coworker get screamed at by a man twice her size because he was removed from the membership which led to several other members getting involved a man who was the epitome of a serial killer and terrified members, a manager who was pushed by an angry member, and another member following me around the store because she was mad that I only refunded her half her money, like I was told to do by my manager, but that's a story for another time, just to name a few. But most of the time, members are pretty nice about situations that arise. My department is pretty closely knit, and despite us getting fairly competitive with our benchmark numbers, we're always there for each other and have the others back, which I think becomes pretty important later on down the road for this story. One day as I was working, I have a gentleman come up with an issue about his membership and credit card. The guy, who I'll refer to as Chris, was probably about six foot two to three, average build, with dark hair, dark eyes, and a beard. He didn't seem to give off any creepy vibes and was very polite as he tells me what the problem was. Apparently, as he was trying to fill his bike up with gas, his membership and credit card wasn't being read properly. He explains that he comes into town maybe once or twice a week, and he really only stops at our store to fill up his tank. He also said that the card has his name on it, but it had his mom's membership number and her membership picture in the back but that he is on her membership as her household member. I asked to see his card and driver's license, which he hands over, and I type in the membership number to pull it up on our system. 
I continued to have a pretty decent conversation with him, as well as joke how I was always the person to get weird and interesting issues with cards. Chris laughs and, after a moment, points beside me and tells me that he knows one of my other co-workers, Tim, as they used to work together at a fast food restaurant, and if he ever gives you trouble, let me know, he said. I just laugh and brush it off, thinking it's just some sort of inside joke between Tim and Chris, and continue to search through the membership. Turns out, Chris isn't anywhere on the membership, nor does it appear as though he was ever on the membership at all, or any other memberships either. Pretty weird stuff, so I call over a supervisor and show her the system and explain the situation to her. All the while, continuing to crack jokes and have friendly banter with Chris while he waits. She says his best bet would be to call the credit card company we're partnered with and figure out what happened to put his name on a credit card tied to his mom's membership. He says he can do that, then asks if there's any way he can still get gas. The supervisor says sure and tells me to call the gas station to let the attendant know Chris was coming down and that he needed some help getting the gas. I tell the attendant when he answers the phone that Chris would be coming down with a motorcycle to get gas, briefly tell him what happened with his membership, then let the attendant know he's okay to get gas today. He just needs help getting it. The attendant says okay. I hang up and Chris thanks me after telling me that my name was very beautiful and unique. I thank him, tell him to have a good day, and he leaves. I figured that was that, right? Wrong. Fast forward a couple of days. I'm closing the membership desk with Tim, and I'm not entirely sure how we got onto the topic, but Chris comes up in our conversation. Tim asks if I remember Chris, and after a little description I say, Oh, Chris, the guy with a really weird situation with the credit card and his mom's membership, right? Tim says yeah and tells me something that made me uncomfortable. When he went outside for his break an hour or so after Chris had supposedly left, he ran into Chris hanging out by the front entrance. He says Chris flagged him down and after sharing some brief pleasantries, Chris starts acting a little twitchy and nervous and says, Hey, uh, remember that girl who was helping me with my credit card? What's, what's her name? She's cute. Is she single? I think she's got a thing for me and I wanted to ask her out. Tim then goes on to tell me that after he told Chris that I wasn't single, Chris became visibly upset, muttered something under his breath and stormed off. Tim also told me, even if you were single, I still would have told him that you weren't. He's not that good of a guy. Dude's got some issues. Upon hearing this, my first reaction is to laugh nervously and brush off what Tim said as just a weird reaction, but on the inside, I'm freaking out. I read too many stories and have watched too many crime shows to not think the worst, and I've had my fair share of insane encounters over the years to always be on edge. But I assure myself that nothing will come out of the situation, and I was just working myself up over nothing. And it was true. For a few days. Cut to Saturday, one of the busiest days for retail shopping. Membership and refunds are fairly busy with anywhere between 5 to 15 minute intervals without members to give us downtime to clean, file paperwork, etc. I'm having a pretty good day, just shooting the breeze with my coworkers and trying to be on top of everything. Since it was at a slow period, we were running breaks and our supervisor was doing some office work so it was just me, Addy, Rick who was filling up the kiosk, and Emmy, who was working on the returns that were trickling in. I was having a conversation with Addie and organizing the returns when I hear someone yelling at me from behind. Hey! Hey, hey, hey! I'm talking to you, hey! I vaguely recognize the voice, but it's only when I turn around to look at who's shouting at me that I know who it is, and my heart drops into my stomach. Standing in front of me is Chris who looks angry and disheveled. He's standing as close to the counter as he can, glaring at me with a menacing look. Hoping maybe he just needs some help and it's nothing serious, I plaster on my friendly customer service smile and walk over to the computer closest to where he was standing. Hey, Chris, uh, what can I do for you? You got another weird situation you need me to take a look at? 
I force out a laugh, but he doesn't even crack a smile. Instead, he points his finger at me, and when he speaks, his voice is this super low murmur that only added to the creepiness, menacing factor. You lied to me. By now, Addy seems to sense my discomfort and stands to the computer next to me, pretending to be working on something while listening in on the conversation. I tell Chris, I'm sorry, what do you mean? Did the bank not figure out the issue? He shakes his head and says that that isn't the problem. I asked him what the problem is and he says, You. You're the problem. You led me on. I'm sure my confusion is visible and Addie and I exchange a glance. She subtly gestures if she should get a manager and I subtly tell her no before I turn my attention back to him. I ask what he means by that and he states that I let him on when... I knew he was flirting with me because I was flirting back despite having a boyfriend and that it was a real terrible thing for me to do. I say, I'm very sorry if it seemed that way, but I wasn't flirting with you. I was just being polite. I didn't realize you were flirting with me. I'm, I'm sorry. He starts to become more upset, pulling at his hair, rubbing his face and says, No, you did know, and you were just pulling me along. I'm not someone to be messed with like that, and you're going to regret messing with me. At this point, Rick had just come back from the kiosk, and Addie was quietly filling him in on the situation away from me and Chris so that they wouldn't be overheard. Rick, who's a Navy veteran and a pretty large guy at about six foot one and heavy set, is watching Chris closely and when Chris starts to seem threatening, he puts himself into the conversation. Rick asks Chris if there is a problem, but Chris ignores him and continues to berate me. While I stay quiet, too scared to speak. He calls me some stuck-up wench who's probably with some a-hole if I even was with someone. Typical nice guy, am I right? And that I could have had it all if I had just given him a chance. He continues to tell me that I wasted that chance the moment I let him on that he was going to make me pay. Chris then reaches over the counter and tries to grab my arm or slap me or something, but Rick pushes me to the side away from Chris and Addie is on the radio calling for a supervisor or manager to please come to the membership desk now. I remember seeing a front-end supervisor running from the cashier line to where the membership desk was, and I remember panicking, thinking that Chris might have a gun, and what if he tried to hurt someone with it? Meanwhile, as I'm worrying about what could happen, Rick is telling Chris he needs to calm down and not speak to me that way. Chris then loses it and starts slapping his hand on the table and pointing at me, saying that I am a problem and he has every right to speak to me that way because I was being a twat. The supervisor finally shows up as Chris continues to spew crude insults at me. And the supervisor, after realizing Chris was yelling at me and seeing how upset I was, quietly tells me to take my break before radioing for someone else to help at membership and asking Chris what the problem was. I start to leave and Chris starts to follow me, while Rick and the supervisor start following Chris to stop him. I feel myself on the verge of a panic attack and start speed walking while Chris continues to shout at me, and then he pushes me. I manage to catch myself on the battery display and Rick and the supervisor catch up to him and attempt to detain him as best they could, and Addie makes another page to call for warehouse manager and to our security guard while passerbys watch the whole situation go down. The supervisor tells me to go and this time I run to the break room where I have a complete breakdown, shaking and crying and unable to breathe as other employees on their break ask if I'm okay and try to help out. After maybe 10 minutes, when I had just started to calm down, one of the warehouse managers, Lena, and the security guard come in and ask if I can go with them into the office. I follow and we go into the GM and AGM's office and shut the door. They tell me to sit down and after they ask if I'm okay and ask what happened, to which I told them the entirety of the story, they tell me that Chris got away. I'm too shocked to ask anything other than how and they explained that not long after I left and right before they arrived at the membership desk, Chris managed to get out of the hold he was in and 
ran to the closed door beside the exit, which he pushed open to avoid the crowd and set off the alarm that Lena had to shut off and then booked it to the parking lot. They spent the next five or so minutes trying to locate him, but he was gone, and there are no cameras outside the warehouse to try and capture his license plate or anything else. And because of his strange membership situation and because we only had his first name and a description of what he looked like, there was no way we could pull him up in the system to notify authorities. The only thing we did have was a grainy video of him getting hostile at the desk, following and pushing me, then assaulting Rick by elbowing them in the face and pushing the supervisor back, which wouldn't be difficult since Chris was about a head taller and was larger than the supervisor, to eventually get away. I was livid that he escaped, but also terrified, and the feeling of fear only escalated when Lena said, We want you to know that he threatened he'd be back. They offered to have a fellow co-worker walk with me to my car at the end of my shift, which I was more than thankful for, and that they would have lock security be more vigilant in making sure no one strange came by our store when we were closed until the whole situation was either solved or died down. There was nothing more I could do, and the most my work could do was to keep on the lookout for Chris and alert others if he came into the store again. I felt powerless, I still feel powerless. Always being on edge and on the lookout for Chris is driving me crazy, and I'm so paranoid I'll somehow run into him I avoid going places. The walk to and from my car before and after every shift is terrifying because I don't know if Chris is watching me, and if I think a vehicle has been following me for too long I make random turns until I lose them. I'm scared Chris is going to come back to the store or find me when I'm alone and do something awful. The only piece I found was when I left the state for a week for a trip, but even then I was still a little paranoid he managed to follow me. I keep a pocket knife close by anywhere I'm at, and I'm planning on getting my concealed weapons permit just to feel safer. Does that... does that make me crazy? This happened about 15 years ago. At the time, I was dating around and I had a few creepy encounters during that time, but this guy takes the cake. He was an acquaintance my brother had met in a bar a few times and was showing around the local area because he was new to the country. My brother set us up because he was apparently desperate for a girlfriend, and I guess I was pretty desperate too because we went on a date together. That date was probably the worst first date I've ever been on. I showed up to the restaurant we were meeting at, he was late, which isn't a huge deal so I let it slip and we went to sit down. To be honest, I knew from the start I wasn't really attracted to him, but I thought I would be polite and see if we had a nice night. He started off politely too, he held the door for me, pulled my seat out, it wasn't really necessary but it was nice anyway. Then when we were sitting down waiting for someone to come and take our orders, I was reading the menu and he started talking about how much his fiancé would have liked this place. That took me by surprise and naturally I asked about his fiancé. He revealed that he had a fiancé before moving over here, but he had just left her to move to another country. I asked why they had broken up and he said they never really broke up as such but he got fed up of her nagging him about various things and just moved away. I really didn't know what to say after that so I changed the subject and started asking him more about himself and where he used to live. He wasn't really very forthcoming. Eventually our waiter turned up and started talking to us. To clarify for the next part, our waiter was a man of color and he had an unusual accent for our area so my date stares blankly at him for a while then turns to me and says, do you understand this guy? I said that yes, I could understand him before telling him our orders. After he left, my lovely date continued to shock me. He said, I wouldn't normally leave ordering to the lady, but that brown guy talked really weird and I didn't get it. Wow, way to tell me you're a racist and sexist in one breath, dude. Again, I was speechless for a few moments before I got angry with him. I don't remember exactly what I said, it was something along the lines of, well, I'm not a lady, so I can order for myself just fine, thanks. And why make racial remarks? 
Then he got annoyed with me and told me he wasn't being racist. He just wasn't used to that kind of person where he was from. I pointed out that he wouldn't have met me if he just stuck to people he was used to in his own country. He did calm down then and told me that he wouldn't want that because he's glad to have met me. Honestly, I found that a little weird given that I didn't see any way to say that this date was going well and he didn't know me very well at all. But I decided since we had ordered, I should stay, get my meal and try to redeem the evening before I leave and never see this man ever again. So I answered some of his questions about me, basic getting to know me and small talk stuff for the most part, then started on about previous dates. If I was a virgin, whether I would be willing to wait until marriage and then be submissive to my husband or not. It was at this point I realized that I was most likely on a date with a religious bigot, hence the misogyny, weird attitude to sexual stuff and all his other closed-minded nonsense. So I settled for a, none of your business, now I need to leave. I checked the prices on the menu and left money for half of the food, plus a tip on the table and got up to leave. He said he didn't see why I was being unreasonable with him, as though this had been a normal date, and then told me that I couldn't expect him to take my money because that was an insult to him. Fine, dude. If you want to pay for a meal that's not even getting eaten, you pay for it. I'm not that mad about spending my money that I'll stop you. So I took my money back and walked straight out. I just assumed that yes, it was an awful evening, but I wouldn't have to see him again. I wasn't even back to my house when my brother started texting me, asking me where I was because my date had called him in tears saying I had gone off for no reason and he didn't know where I was or what to do. Thankfully, my brother was pretty calm about it and assumed that I had left for a reason. I explained everything to him and he was pretty surprised too. After that night, we both tried to cut contact. My brother stopped meeting with the guy and we both blocked the Facebook account we had for him too. My brother also blocked his number because he would not stop texting him about me, alternating between being really worried about me to saying he had hoped I dropped dead. Then he started making endless different accounts on social media to harass us. He told my brother he didn't know why we weren't talking to him. He posted a bunch of weird posts describing me in detail before going on to call me a lot of horrible names. We kept blocking them and moving on. Then the harassment got worse. He either found me and followed me at some point, or got my address from a friend and turned up one day, standing around outside my house, asking to come in and speak to me. When I refused to let him in, he grabbed my arm to prevent me from going in either and started to tell me that he didn't want to let me go because I would never find a man who would love me like he did, and that if I walked away from him again, I would regret it one day when I was old and lonely. He went on and on like this for ages and ages while I tried to pull my arm away from him. Before I got fed up of this and yelled at him to get off of me and leave me alone, and kicked him in the shin. He let go of my arm but cursed at me and said I was being ungrateful to him. But I took my opportunity to run inside and lock my door. He started banging on my door, then trying to push it inwards. I was getting both upset by this man and just super fed up of his presence in my life. So I grabbed my phone and called the police, telling them that someone was trying to get into my house. I was told someone would be with me soon, but 20 to 30 minutes later there was no sign of them anywhere and I was getting quite upset because this man was forcing my door and I thought the lock was going to break soon. So I called my brother who lives nearby just because I knew he would come even though I wasn't sure if he would be able to help much. About 15 minutes later, my brother turns up and after a brief conversation I didn't quite hear outside, the pressure was gone off the door. I waited a few minutes and then texted my brother to see what was going on and if it would be alright to look outside again. He didn't reply and the next thing I heard was the police turning up. I went out to see what was going on. Apparently after my initial call, they had received another call from my neighbors saying that there were two men fighting on my lawn. I guess this was my brother and the guy, since my brother looked out of breath and pretty shook up and the guy wasn't around anymore. My brother explained to the police that he had tried to stop the man getting into the house and then the man had hit him. I told my side of the story and some of the other neighbors were asked what they had seen and were able to tell them about his attempts to get in. 
Plus, there were marks on the other side of the door where he had tried repeatedly to get in. The police went to look for him, and a few weeks afterwards, I was called and told they thought they had found him, but when they wanted me to take a look at the suspected person, it wasn't the same man. I didn't hear anything else, and I don't know what happened to him. I didn't see him again, and so I'm probably safe after what has now been 15 years. Regardless, I don't ever want to see him again. At my college, our student IDs are pretty much essential to have. They get you into all of the academic buildings and get you all your food on the meal plan. I had lost mine and was forced to go get a new one. I went to the security desk and told the security guard that I lost my ID and needed a new one made. He said, No problem, just uh, come with me while I print you a new one. He was older, if I had to guess I would say about 65, but in very good shape. Definitely over six foot and you could tell he was attractive when he was younger. He had curly gray hair, very well kept and ice blue eyes. We went to the back security room in the main student commons building. It was a room that was a little ways back but still had a good amount of food traffic going by it. I walked in and sat on the couch that was across from the desk. When he walked in he closed the door. He went on the computer at the desk and asked me all my information student ID number, name, birthday, class year. When he pulled up my account, he saw my picture that is used for my ID. He asked me if I wanted a new picture taken for the new ID, and I said, no, I'm good, because I don't like my picture taken, but also I looked a mess because I wasn't expecting to need a new picture taken. He then said, well, your picture is very good. You look pretty. Most are bad. I laughed and said thank you and told him I was a senior in high school and Got that taken at orientation almost three years ago, as I was a senior now. And he responds, Well, you must have always been pretty. I started to feel weird then, but this is a security officer at my college, and it's known for having great security. He then said that the computer wasn't letting him print one without taking a new picture since it was so old. He told me, If you need to get a new ID, it makes you get a new picture after two years, because people can change in looks and... We need to make sure it's you and have good information. Okay, you just asked me if I wanted a new one, but are now telling me I need a new one. I found this weird because I thought if that was the case, he would have known that in the beginning, but again, he's a security officer and I needed this stupid ID. I said okay, and he said he would set everything up. He went into a closet within this security room and got out a camera on a tripod and told me to stand up against the wall. I did and smiled. He told me I needed to take my hair out of the bun because the hair needed to be down for the picture ID. Okay, but I didn't think much of this either as I had never seen a girl's ID without their hair down, which I now realize is just preference. He took a picture and said my eyes were closed. I laugh because my eyes are closed in 9 out of 10 pictures I take. Another reason I don't like my picture taken. He said, it's fine, I don't mind taking a couple. He then came over and told me my hair looked awkward so he was going to fix it for me so I liked the picture better. He fixed my hair and I pulled my head back and said, it's good, I really don't care, no one's going to look at it. He rolled his eyes and said, whatever. It's your picture, but it would look better if I fixed it. Again, I said, it's fine, don't worry, just trying to be polite. After then, the next picture, I saw a clock on the wall and realized I only had ten minutes before class. I said, you can just use whatever one I don't have my eyes closed in because I have to be in class in ten minutes, so I kind of have to go. He responds, your professor isn't going to get mad at you if you say you were getting an ID from security and it took a while. At this point, I realized I had been in there for over 20 minutes, and I wasn't nervous, but more so sick of being there and wanted out. He then told me they'd take a few minutes to print and just wait on the couch. He then talked to me, asking me what my major is, if I had a boyfriend. I do, so I said yes. He asked me how long we had been dating and said, 
Oh, you know guys in college are no good. They'll just waste your time. You should break up with them and find someone older and more mature. Whatever, dude, just give me my ID. I didn't respond to that and just said, Okay, well, I'm gonna go and because I don't want to be late for class, so would I be able to pick it up at the desk maybe after class? He huffed and then said, What a rush you're in, but it should be ready. Now, hold on. He then went back from the desk to the back of the room where the printer was and grabbed my ID. He said, Wow, the picture is even better. I'm a pretty good photographer if I do say so myself, and winked. He kept holding the ID, not handing it to me. I was annoyed at this point, but am really bad at being assertive. I said, I'm sorry, I really have to go. And he laughed and said, Okay, okay. I would think a senior wouldn't be nervous about being a little late. Then he handed me the ID. I basically snatched it out of his hands, and he said, Well, I'll walk you out because you aren't supposed to be back here without a security guard. I wouldn't want you getting in trouble. I'm thinking, oh my god, just let me go. So he walked me out and I said thanks and basically ran out of the building. I'm not going to lie. I thought he was weird and flirty, but I had never needed to get an ID made before, so I just thought that's how the process was and that he was just a little too flirty with the situation, so I never said anything to anyone. With three weeks left of school, I somehow managed to lose my ID again. I had been borrowing my boyfriend's because I was super busy at the end of the year and I just thought, I really don't have a half hour to spare to get a new ID. Finally, my boyfriend got annoyed with me using his meal plan and always having his ID and he said, you need to go get a new one, it only takes like five minutes tops. I said, no it doesn't, it took like a half an hour, I don't have time for that. He asked me what I was talking about and I told him what happened and he responds, no, that's that's not at all okay. You need to report that. I said I didn't care enough to, but I asked him to come with me to get a new ID. When I went to get the new one, it was a different security guard, and he said, Yeah, no problem. Just wait here. I'll be back in a minute. Not even five minutes later, he was back with a new one made. I told him what happened last time, and he looked very concerned. He asked who the security guard was. I didn't know his name, but I described him. He gave me the name and office of the head security guard and told him he would call and tell them I was coming over. I went and talked to the head security officer and he told me what happened was not at all protocol and he looked in the system and saw over 30 pictures taken of me. He reported it to higher ups. I had to go in and speak to a group of three people in administration and let me know that he was fired and would not be allowed on campus again and to notify them if I see him. I know it doesn't sound that crazy like most of the stories on here and I really didn't feel like I was in danger, but I think I was too naive to feel that at the time. I trusted every security guard, but I have no idea what his intentions were. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, I'm Let's Read, and my farts smell like cheddar and garbage, be sure to check my septic tank for all of the latest on Let's Read.